So I wanted to welcome everybody to Simple MD the podcast. Uh, today's segment is going to be really talking about keeping your mind sharp and young. And coming out of this pandemic, it's an important thing to think about as we're, you know, maybe got a little bit dull during the last year. So there's a lot of great information out and about, and we want to distill it, and make it a little less complicated and a little more simple for everybody. Let's keep it simple. Start today. Keeping your mind sharp and young. So um, I've got two of my favorite people in the world, Richie and Adam, who are going to help sort of declutter what's out there. And we're going to go through um, some stuff that was uh, seen on WebMD, which is one of our favorite resources to uh, accumulate a lot of this information. And uh, I think we'll start with that. So with that, let me throw it over to Adam, uh, as it's your first time on the Simple MD podcast. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Welcome. Um, let's let's go through and, and talk about keeping your mind young and sharp and, and um, some things that uh, you've heard about. Sure. I uh, came across an interesting list, uh, some content uh, on the um, uh, WebMD website, and I thought that maybe we could walk through uh, some suggestions, get uh, your perspective, Ari, and Rich's perspective, and I might throw in my perspective on... Uh, different ways to stay young, stay sharp. So I'll kick it off with um, the first element on the list, which is give your life a soundtrack. Music, basically. Music. Music. Yeah, sorry, pause. Music. (laughs) Well, um, listen, music is absolutely uh, critical. Uh, It has been found and studied a great Harvard study, a European heart journal study that it helps a variety of things, including uh, the heart, which doesn't seem that intuitive, but in some ways it does. We do a lot of stress testing in our office, you know, the cardiovascular office. We do a lot of stress, thousands and thousands. And it has been made very clear that if you use music while on a treadmill, you will achieve more benefit. Mm-hmm. Not just the short term, like how long you can run it, and of course how enjoyable it is, but ultimately with your heart rate and blood pressure does. So some really cool things in those particular studies, whether it was a bike or a treadmill for that matter. And you relax the arteries. Um, there is a also good study showing the difference between relaxation of the actual arteries while exercising, whether to music or not to music. We even looked at people recovering from heart surgery and found that music can help in the recovery. There's this thing that goes on, something to do with the mind and math. Believe it or not, it comes down to some math, like your brain's doing some sort of math equation when it hears like the way music is distributed mm-hmm. to, to, to the brain. So that somehow is relaxing. <laughs> even people that don't love math, uh, that's kind of how it goes in. So they may even feel the less pain and anxiety if there's music around. When we do our procedures in the office, all of our procedures are done with music. It's a requ- like if we don't have the audio vis- visual system, we, we pretty much will stop a procedure so it can bring in a speaker because it relaxes people. It's better and safer than giving an injection sometimes of a, say, an anxiolytic or some, some, you know, some sort of narcotic or something. And even stroke victims have been found that when they're in recovery and they start listening to music, they actually get a bit faster, they get better a bit faster mm-hmm. with singing. So there's something that goes through the brain that can work sometimes quicker to sing than to speak. And you've seen that sort of people like stutter. Yeah, Yeah, I think it's a good idea to try adding some of your favorite music more to your life. Well, you know, it's interesting as you're you're talking about this and and today we're talking about keeping your mind young and sharp. uh, As far as the math goes, I know that, you know, we all have kids and and, uh, I know that your your daughter in particular is very, very musical. We uh, encouraged, I'm going to use air quotes, encouraged our kids to play the piano um, when they were younger and aggressively resisted for uh, as long as, as possible. But we knew that, the, that, that playing piano or playing an instrument was valuable from a cognitive standpoint early on. I think it's interesting that um, a more passive approach, this just listening to music, uh, it seems to be helpful as well to, to keeping yourself sharp and on the ball. Did you guys do when, when, um, when we had our first child, actually both of our children, we did those like baby, uh, baby Einstein, I think it was mm-hmm. called, where you, yep. you put the sort of music, the classical music on the on on my wife's belly at the time, and supposedly there were some, you know, benefits to... 
Yeah, at the end of the show, I will sing the Baby Einstein <laughs> theme song because we've heard it so many times. I'm, I'm hopeful that it won't actually be recorded for posterity. But yeah, we're <laughs> pretty familiar with it. Yeah, we did, we did all that too, a lot of the music playing. You want to hear an, an interesting story? A buddy of mine, his uncle, uh, his cousin, actually got in a terrible car accident. She, uh, she was a young girl, about 1920 years old when it happened and she was basically you know i would say a vegetable i don't know what the, the medical term is but uh, uh, she, she was at so she was in a living uh, assisted living facility for quite a long time but every day her dad would come and put music on mm. every day for for years and they had taken her off life support she was living this way for about 20 years this went on the dad passed the music stopped playing, and she passed away also. No, wow. I, I wouldn't say that's completely related to the music, but it's kind of related to what we're talking about here. Mm. I, w- I wonder what that... Well, there's definitely something that goes on with engaging brain cells, right? So when these stroke victims, and they look at them, you know, and, and uh, you know, very specifically, and, the, and they've reproduced this actually in the animal model, that there's this engagement of different parts of the brain. Maybe it's the you know the, the the math, if you will, and the and the and the non-math parts of the brain, because you are deciphering something when you hear music, and it gives you this kind of pleasure um, when you decipher yep. it. So um, the ability to recover. I, I had a patient once that had a stroke years ago. It's a true story. And he was an emigre from Eastern Europe and he learned a couple of languages. And they played some music inadvertently just to, you know, like like with your situation with, with the, the, the patient was almost, you know, comatose. And apparently they, they, they engaged a part of his brain. In this case, it was Hebrew. And that mm. was not his first language and it was not his last language. Not his, it wasn't mm. English. I think his first language was like Hungarian or something. And they played, and he only, when he, when he um, emerged from the stroke and got better and did, was by acting as an outpatient, only spoke Hebrew. Could only remember Hebrew, could not remember the previous part. So the music somehow correlated the synapses. So, you know, they say the brain is the final frontier. We're just learning a lot of these things. One thing is really clear that, you know, from the beginning of a, of a stress test and ability to exercise all the way through um, recovery, you know, music is something different than just the spoken word. Before so. we um, jump on to the next topic, because I know we'll, we'll, we'll need to do that, I'm just curious for each of you guys, like if, if you had to pick a, a song or an artist that helps you focus or stay, um, you know, more connected to, to a task, do you guys have one that comes to mind? No. I don't. <laughs> I don't do any tasks. <laughs> Next next topic. Silence. I love, for me, it's jazz. Okay. So so, and it's kind of a modern interpretation of jazz. And I don't know why the complicated part of jazz, like I think we were talking earlier, that yeah. even our our theme song has a, a jazzy riff to it. Nora Jones, when I first heard that, was what I could um, sort of best keep in the background if I was going to try and study with a little bit of music. You can't. I, I cannot study with like heavy music. I really. You know that, that that's a complicated. That's a different thing about multitasking. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But in terms of um, my, I think the thing that I feel most healthful, not something that would invigorate me on a on a long bike ride or something, right. but maybe the most zen is 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 a type of jazz. If you listen to a Nora Jones type jazz, it's man, is it? It just. I think it's. We talked about this like the the theme for the podcast is kind of a Nora Jones-esque interpretation. There's an intellectualism with it. Maybe it's slow enough that I'm doing the math right. properly. I, I, I don't know why that is, but that really gives me uh, an ability to learn better. What, what You said you have a song that actually works for you? Uh, uh. Well, I, I have a specifically related to math, which was what I thought was the most, most uh, compelling part of, of what we've discussed so far. So there's a progressive metal band called Tool, which you may be familiar with. <laughs> yes. And um, well, what I like about them and some of those other bands is that they have uh, very um, complex uh, tempo changes, chord progressions, time signatures. So I always feel like my brain's being engaged. And there's this one song, which I didn't really know about. I did, I did a little bit of research on. You'll never listen to it, I don't think. It's called Lateralis. But the 
Time signature is a Fibonacci sequence. The, Sounds delicious. It, it is yeah. delicious and very Italian. <laughs> I'd like the Fibonacci. Is, is, is he um, speaking English? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I nerd, nerded out for a second, um, but I, I find it really cool. And so what I'll do is I'll put on a Tool album and just let it roll over and over again. And, it, it, you know, I, I, the, the thing that you had said about being Zen-like, being in flow, you know, where where you're a little disconnected from the reality and you can really be in your work. So it's while you're working, it's not relaxing. It, it, it's no, it's for me, it's while I'm working. For for relaxing, I, I'm, I'm a little less selective, but while I'm working, I do like something that's kind of working my brain in the background. The other, the other thing I'll do, probably for different reasons, is that when I'm writing, for instance, I'll put on um, a lot of Hans Zimmer music, you know, which is all these movie soundtracks. So whether it's uh, Inception, which is very mathematical, or Pirates of the Caribbean, which is very not mathematical, but you, you know, you get inspired to, to write stuff. So, you know, I, I do find it as a tool to help push me forward. Well, from a science perspective, we're not exactly sure what's going on, but we, we do think that there's a, a, some sort of math-related thing with the progressions, with the, uh, you know, the variance in movement somehow. We're, we're trying to decode that. When we do, like a crossword puzzle, you get like a, an endorphin release yeah. when that, like, that riff comes on from a Led Zeppelin album or the part of the rap song that really flows, they call it the flow, right? So it's something that happens where you get a release of endorphin which counters the cortisol that's either built up from before, maybe even built up from the music where, where you know, there's kind of a release and that release is, is very important to our blood pressure and to our heart rate and to everything that we're doing. So we could, so the, you know, the endorphins uh, that are released by music are just very important in many, many ways. So, um, okay, let's go on. Let's go on to the next, um, the next part of keeping your mind young and sharp. You know, post pandemic. Uh, make time to make friends. We definitely have this thing in our brain that require us not just to have friends, but believe it or not, to make new friends. So, there's been a lot of studies talking about you know this this part of the brain called the hippocampus. It was a study out of McGill that, that, that moved me in Canada that showed that like the size of the hippocampus, the actual volume, uh, can increase based upon our social interactions and developing them. So I, I got to interrupt you for for sure. a moment because uh, the podcast is Simple MD. So tell tell me what the hippocampus does, where is it, and and why it's important. Okay, so there are there's a part of the brain that really is involved with what's called executive function. You may, you may have seen this as our kids sort of grow up, but suffice it to say, without getting too, too technical, it's it's an important part of the brain, brain that is it, we're able to see it light up with an MRI. So that technology has gotten good enough right now, both the human model and what we sometimes use the animal model, which is often mice. And you can see this area of the brain that lights up when it gets challenged a little bit, and we find that to be a good thing. So not only is it important to have social interactions um, a bit every day, um, but it's also important to challenge it a little bit. So for instance, there was a great study that was in London where they looked at cab drivers and they showed that the cab drivers that were using the back streets to get to their area versus ones that were using kind of the more traditional and repetitive areas. So got, they were taking- Got paid a lot more money. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, maybe, but their hippocampus, the part of the brain that suggests that they're training a part of their brain for useful function in other parts of life was larger. Hmm. And that goes on even to discuss this sort of ski slope theory. Those of us that have had the luxury of skiing, you know, when you go down, it gets kind of, you know, later in the season and you keep going down the sort of, sort of same area, you can see like how rigid and icy those areas become, right? You keep going down that same ski path. Well, the brain works very similar to that. You keep doing it, it becomes rigid and you can keep going down it and it's fine, but it doesn't um, allow the other areas mm -hmm. to develop. So by changing those a little bit, not saying there isn't important to sometimes having a daily routine, but altering that by taking the back street sometimes, by meeting new people and keeping that part of your brain that allows you to sort of function. Stimulation. Yeah, stimulation executively function with those. So you're, you're, you're able to interact with them in a, in a multitude of ways, keeps that 
ski slope of the brain mm -hmm. from being too rigid, and we find that that helps with um, less uh, dementia as, as we get older. So, it, it, and, it, and this speaks to how our parents are aging now. We want them to be involved in situations that are challenging to them. So throw that in with maybe a little exercise at the same time. So maybe you're walking now with friends. Maybe you're walking now with new friends. Right. Walking group with new friends. Very, very beneficial, it seems. Um, throw in some music. So I don't know if you're walking with friends and all singing. <laughs> I don't know. That was interesting. I was, I, was at a, uh, I was at a game last night, the Panthers game. And they did the national anthem. It was one of the first times post-pandemic that we had been with a group of people who had been isolated for a while. And everybody sang the national anthem more so than usual. Like usually, you, you, sometimes you see national anthem people are like kind of disinterested. Right. I've never seen <clears throat> such an exuberance. Like everyone was so excited to be together and to sing together. Right. There was a catharsis because I was really watching. I was feeling it myself. I was like, like almost getting emotional on the national anthem, and I wasn't feeling. It wasn't just the you know patriotic nature. It was like we're all together and we're singing, and everybody felt more emotional there was an exuberance that came out of that i really believe that the combination of singing and of course the exercise of going to a you know a big environment like that and being together let endorphins in myself and i, I can tell you all the 50,000 oh, people sure. that were there so if that doesn't tell us that socializing with with people and, and new people is good for the brain i don't know what would you know i think as um as we're reviewing these things and uh, there are two paths. I mean, you have old friends and, and there's a comfortability with those friends and you can um, kind of dispense with a lot of the f formality. Uh, again, you know, Ari, your statement about making new friends, I think, is harder, particularly as we get older. You know, that's, uh, I call this sort of the anti-curmudgeon um, uh, antidote here is that you're forced to be attentive, polite, interesting, um, li you know, listen as much as you speak and all these things, which, you know, we forget to do in our homes and with, with, our, with our friends and family. Um, and, and you have to do that. And I'm sure it's stimulating other parts of your brain that, you know, it's a, it's an active, it's, it's active, it's not passive. And I think that's, that's what I like about this and what I get out of this. You know, it's one of the more interesting things to see is when you see a grandparent, an older grandparent, see a new baby. Mm -hmm. Why is that almost universally so exciting to them? I think because they have a lot in common. They're both wearing diapers. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're, they're unintelligible half the time. Uh, but um, yes, right. They're, 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 they're able to engage. They, they make that contact. Well, it's, a new, yeah. it's, it's new ski slopes. So right. new ski slopes for them you know, what, what, you know, how do I interact with this child? Isn't this terrific? I, I get to interact with this new thing where oftentimes they may not be seeing new things. They're maybe seeing the same, the same people all the time. So it's, it's, I don't think there's any question to this uh, fact of getting to know new people. Just bringing it back to COVID a little bit, the, the fact that people were isolated. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, you're, you're, you're citing studies that say probably being isolated, not, not socializing, not meeting new people is, is hurtful for right. the brain. Right. And, those, so that's, and so the antithesis, the catharsis yeah. of, imagine a lot of those people at the stadium ha had been really in quarantine for a year. Now all of a sudden they're with 50,000 people, everyone, you know, hopefully vaccinated or at least, you know, <laughs> hopefully. And, and, you know, singing together all, all of a sudden. It was, an, an, an it is, it's going across the country right now. Sure. It's, it's basically just showing that the opposite, you know, they say if, if food, it, we'll get to this in a second, but if certain foods can make you sick, then the good foods can make you better. Right. S similarly, if isolation and not m being around new people can make you lonely and depressed, well, being around new people in a positive environment can make Should you healthy. Reverse it. I, I Absolutely, think we had a lot of health last night. Conversely, being friends, with, being friends with you guys for this long has another disadvantage. Is what you taught me today. <laughs> My mind's getting less sharp and older. Being friends with you guys. So. Yeah. Well, it's been nice knowing you, Rich. I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to damage your health anymore. So it's been a, been a good time while it lasted. <laughs> it's not. It's uh, for for this for that reason alone. Okay, so let's go on to the next topic that um, was brought up on on, on WebMD and in keeping your mind young and sharp. Yeah, well, the next one's it's simple. Uh, la laugh it off. Uh, seems to have fun. Have a good time. Have a good laugh keeps your mind young young and sharp. You know, I, I happen to love comedians, so so definitely 
you, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I make a friend when I go watch a comedian, but it almost seems like you, you do stimulate your brain and you're, you're, you're learning a, a new interaction with somebody. We could definitely have an entire podcast about laughter, right? Laughter is, you know, colloquially known as the best medicine. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's for a reason. Um, the, the scientific reason is basically that the stress hormone is, is cortisol, right? So that's the major stress hormone and the almost the anti, antidote to that happens when you laugh so you, you do a bunch of things when you laugh you take a deep breath so you oxygenate better you know when you're you know you're laughing you tend to stimulate organs by breathing deeper taking in uh, you know oxygen if you will but there's a lot of little things that are going on L laughter can cause um facial muscles to sort of fire that aren't often firing and they've actually found sort of skin improvement the dermatologists have shown skin improvement in people that uh, laugh more it's sci mm. scientifically uh, s certainly uh i've seen examples of that um and if negative thoughts can manifest into certain reactions, right? Similar to what we talked about, if you know, eating bad food can make you say, well, if, ne if negative thoughts can manifest into into chemical reactions that can affect your body, then a positive thought should be the counter to that. And what's the most positive thought is basically laughing. Um, but it also causes painkillers. They've shown that in people in um, significant painful disease states, that laughter can almost be, if not better than certain uh, medications. Hmm. So being able to laugh is a painkiller. Uh, and a lot of people have a lot of painful things going on, whether emotionally or physically. There's also this ability to connect to others. Have you ever been in a room and someone's laughing and you, you want to go, you want to find it, you want to find that? That's, I don't know if that's Darwinian or whatever it is, but you hear someone laugh, where's that, where's that coming from? I, I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. You know, one of the things is we're, we're, we're talking about this, and I'm, I'm trying really hard not to make this part of our conversation just a laugh festival because we'll never get to the next thing. But, you know, um, I've been accused of being humorous from, from time to time. I think it's a two-way, easy now, I think it's a two-way street. Accused in a court of law? Or yeah, well, um, that's for the, that, maybe that's for the other, other podcast we're going to do. That was not funny. Uh, the, the, the thing that I find most valuable about it is not just laughing, but um, giving the gift of laughter. I feel like if you make an attempt to make someone smile, whether you know it's, it's a gesture or it's saying something clever, um, when I do that, I feel improved as well. I've, I've, I, it's an act of giving for, for, for me. If I'm trying to light up someone's day, someone's brain, and say something that you know gives them a good chuckle, I, I get a benefit out of that as well. Which is, I feel like I've, I've, I've gifted you something. I've cared enough to, to not just give you the facts, but to you know color it with some, some commentary that gives you a good laugh. I think that's really, really valuable. So not only the laughing it off part which I think is great that it's on this list and super obvious, and I wish we all did more of that, but, but the contribution component of that I think is equally, equally valuable. And you know, I think that's one of the reasons why in the, the prior topic about making new friends, I mean, part of that, not everyone can be hilarious, but, but the positivity, the playing off of each other to, um, uh, to just feel better about, you know, being amongst another person. I think all those things help the giver as much as the receiver. Well, you know, the, the topic I would say is keeping your mind young and sharp, right? So the young thing's kind of interesting. Give me a guess of what you think, how many times a day a child laughs? Over or under, it's like price is right for laughter. Well, I'm, I went. Okay, what, what do you think? Uh, You're absolutely incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> That's in his household. Yeah, he's not a, it's, he's, right. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, what it's 175. Think? Boy, you're both so under 400. What? 400 scientifically shown that wow. 400 times a child, 400 times a day, a child laughs versus the adult. What do you think, the adult? Four. <laughs> Eighty. <laughs> <laughs> he, he doesn't even have his ears on. He yeah. not, he's just saying 80. Like, right. kind of Ask me another question. <laughs> 80. <laughs> so um, it's, it's 15. So 400 to 15 from adult to, to child. So if you don't think that it feels good to even just feel young, and it's hard to do. Like you almost <laughs> have to... You have to actually work at it a little bit, right? So I think you um, have to work at it to only laugh 15 times in a day. So... 
And that's the average. And that's if I'm average. if I'm laughing a hundred times in a day, there's a bunch of people laughing none times in a day, which right. is awful. Or, or worse, the opposite. Yeah. They're not even not laughing; they're they're crying. Right. You know. Right. So it's it's a real, it's a real thing. I always found it interesting how people that make you laugh a lot often are doing it thoughtfully. So if you think about it, like the you know, on a physical level, like you know Charlie Chaplin was considered like a genius. That was like a without talking. Right, right. Without talking, just from sort of physical movement, f- p- mostly was considered. He was considered a genius. Was supposedly a very, very smart guy. Or how about like uh, you know Colin jo- Jobs Jost from uh, what's his name? Colin uh, you, you, Colin Jost from the Saturday Night Live. Uh, oh yes, the, the, he's, the, he's, he's a newscast. Like, he's the, the, a newscast. Was also right. like a head writer, Harvard grad. And, and that, well, all the, those guys are, are are brilliant. I think it's. Uh, not because I said before that I've been accused of being funny. I think it's hard to, to, to be funny, to be to have the timing, to f- find the pathway that's you know relevant and a, and a hopefully appropriate. And you do know, you, do you know like I, I as a young kid, um, I don't know as much now, but as a young kid, I was always very academically you know oriented. Obviously, to you know become a cardiologist, you have to go through some uh, you know academic uh, cha- you know ch- challenges and barriers, whatever. So my parents would ask me typically, "How's your day at school?" and Academically, it was always pretty good. But I based my good or bad day, not if I got 100 on a test, I based my good or bad day, really up until maybe until medical school, um, whether or not I came up with that funny quip at right. the end of you know some you know English class that was considered to be funny, right? And um, <laughs> Uh, you know, so you had two good days in school. It, not enough, <laughs> not enough. I would go. They go. Why? I don't understand. You didn't have a good day. You, you got like a, you have a, like a, you know good grades and, and right. why? Why wasn't that a good day? I go because I I didn't say anything funny this week or whatever. Right. Or <laughs> sometimes you'll say something to fall flat, you right. know. But when you hit that zinger that makes the teacher laugh as well as all of the other kids, that was what I would consider my my greatest day, you know. So. I think from an early age, I certainly understood that laughter is great medicine, and I hope everybody understands it. All right, so uh, let's keep rolling here. The The next piece of advice to keep your mind young and sharp is to spend time outside. So another truth that is not a Captain Obvious moment um, in that outside does a variety of things to people. First of all, it's the obvious vitamin D. Right, we actually are designed to be outside a bit, and unfortunately, we're also designed. If we're out too long, a lot of us can get cancer. You know, skin cancers. So there is sort of a little bit of a, a tightrope we have to walk in terms of getting out, probably ten to fifteen minutes a day w- without the sunscreen, mm-hmm. and then the rest with some sunscreen. So that's something that's being worked out. Just to now. simplify a little bit, for vitamin D comes from. The sun. Sunlight. Yep. So vitamin D, there is a reaction that happens in the skin that causes vitamin D to be, you know, basically ma- made in our bodies, which is absolutely necessary for a variety of functions, not the least of which, you know, are, are the health of our, of our bones. So we really need vitamin D. We need sunlight, but we too much of it, you know, obviously can, can be harmful uh, on the skin. So 10 to 15 minutes a day of sunlight is, seems to be absolutely necessary. And there's, you know, a lot of studies including an English study that shows, you know, being out sort of walking in a park is, is, is maybe one of the better environments, a green environment. Why that is, they're not really sure. All they have is kind of green environments out there. Maybe it has to do with the, the lack of stimulation coming from a variety of places. We're going to talk mm-hmm. about focus in a minute, but, but you're able to um, sort of declutter uh, the mind. There is studies showing that this idea of, you know, ADHD or um, ADD as it's uh, commonly known as is is reduced when the kids kind of can run outside as opposed to being in environments where they're not running outside, like the sort of the traditional school environment. So concentration can help be helped by being outside. And there's actually been sort of faster healing that they've shown in people in hospitals post-surgery if they get a little bit um, this ability to go outside. So these are the University of Pittsburgh study that made it really clear. And I started noticing over time that when we had people go out after procedures a bit, now one could say, well, it maybe had to do with the exercise or whatever it is. But uh, at the end of the day, when they sort of, you know, countered those variables in the study, there's something to be said about natural light and being outside and being in nature. I think that there's, a, I mean, you had said we're built to be outside. I mean, there's a primal need. To, to be outside, and I know that we've used uh, uh, the pandemic a couple of times to kind of juxtapose the 
badness uh, versus the goodness. I mean, clearly, uh, we've been inside way too long over the past year, year and a half. And I, I think in parallel, Ari, to what you said earlier about people getting together and being able to sing the national anthem, it just feels good to be outside. Um, I mean, there are instances, obviously, we, we're here in Florida where it's the middle of August and it feels the opposite to be outside. But even even just for that moment, you're letting the sunlight hit your face, you're breathing some clean air, It's you're, you're, you're not... Um, contained. And I think that there's probably something happening deep inside our bodies from, you know, millions of years ago that force us to interact with nature. And and that must, uh, you know, create some sort of reaction, which I can't describe other than I know that it feels really good when, when I get outside and, and I'm able to do something, um, b- you know, beyond just standing there, you know, uh, p- you know, play ball with my kids, build something, Dig a hole, plant a tree. I mean, all those things are really primal and really important. Let me tell you something very interesting that happens uh, when we do the procedures in the office. So we we started with general music, and then we went into music videos that seem to act. Because I I don't like to give, if I don't have to give um, conscious sedation, so the less drugs I have to use during a procedure, the the better off. But I I also don't like seeing pain or having patients have any pain. So one of the things that we found that was very useful maybe the most useful of the things that we've done is adding videos that have light music and are of extreme nature. So like Bali or um, these beautiful beaches, serene coves in Hawaii. And we have patients that are sitting there that normally would be very afraid of a needle because we do some of these, you know, very light needle related things when we do some of our vein procedures. And the anxiousness that can happen or be dispelled by the thought of being in nature, not even being in nature, just the thought of being in nature versus something that's, say, complicated, you know, some, some you know, big city thing or, or something that is, you know, not as nature oriented. So I, I think it's partly being in nature, being around fresh air, but I also think that we're designed to go there in our minds to reduce the cortisol Mm -hmm. and release the endorphins. And I'm seeing it in my office. I haven't done a study yet. So that, that's not, you know, know, that's the whole idea of this, you know, virtual reality that that's coming out. But, but suffice it to say that in our little sort of uh, case report or or anecdote, um, there seems to be a benefit to getting a person in the, in their minds to be in nature. I live near the beach. And one of the things that I've been doing for about the last six weeks or so, is every day I get up, I, I do a 20-minute walk. It's not, it's not major exercise at all, but I'm walking along the beach. I'm breathing in fresh air. I do the same thing when I come home. I, I just felt like I was staying inside way too long throughout the day, maybe working a 10- to 12-hour day inside. And I've, I've found that I, not only am I more focused when I get to the office, um, but I also sleep much better since hmm. I, at the end of the day I've been ending with about a 20-minute walk hmm. along, along the beach, breathing in fresh air. So there's definitely something to it. The, the thing about this list, it's not only that, that uh, keeping your mind young and sharp momentarily. Th- these are things that we're talking about that over time in your life that will keep your mind young and fresh throughout your life. So I just want to make that point there. Good, good point. Good point. Well, that's the... You know, our topic is keeping our mind young and sharp and, 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 and keep, you know, not just getting there, but keeping it. So, you know, these the, these routines, and I would say maybe one of the best things that you could do in your scenario is t- to be out in nature, in some sunlight, exercising like you're yeah. doing near, near the beach, but to vary your path periodically. Yeah. You know, to 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 take the back streets home, if you will, the back the back beach, you know. Mm-hmm. But to 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 do that m- might be the best way to sort of orient your exercise. Great. So we covered that topic pretty good. Let's go into the next part of keeping your mind young and sharp, which is sort of ditch the routine and focusing. Um, what what do you think about that uh, in terms of focus? How's your? You seem like an bit of an ADD dude, Adam, what, what, uh, what is your, what is your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I, th- I think so there's a couple of things. I mean, one is 
efficiency, doing stuff where you're in a routine, you want to just get it done. And, and it may be a thing that you've done all the time. So for instance, I, I live on the west side of town and my uh, son goes to school the, on the east side of town. And it'd be very easy just to take the same route to his school every time. Sometimes I'll I'll take a different route. Um, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Now it's also easy to rely on the technology, which is the other part of this is, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I know where I'm going. I've lived in, the, in, in, in Broward County for the majority of my life. It's not like I need Google Maps to tell me how to get to my son's high school. So, you know, I think that as you're doing that, you got to pay more attention. I think all these things, you know, the, the, the commonality and a lot of things we're talking about here is that you're, you're, you're forced to be actively participating. You almost can put your, your, your car or your brain on autopilot if you take that same route in your exercise or, or, or picking up your son. Um, or daughter from school. So, you know, for me, I do try to every once in a while, uh, you know, if the traffic's not flowing right, I'm like, well, listen, I know it's a grid. I'm going to get there eventually. Let me try a different a different way to get there. Um, but when we were first re- reviewing this, um, and I promise I won't go deep into the details, but uh, uh, Kevin Hart does a great routine where he can tell you how long, y- you know, you've been with your wife based on your routine in the bedroom. Um, and he goes through a whole progression of activities. I, I, uh, for this podcast, I will not get into the details, nor could I do his delivery justice. But I will tell you that it's a thing that we all recognize about ourselves just in terms of our da- daily activities, whether it's you know engaging with your spouse or a stranger, whatever the case might be. Daily activities? Uh, da- yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, you you've, outed, you've outed me. Uh, month, your monthly activities. Right, right as the case might be. So I think um, what I really like about this is that it, the other part that I was going to get to is that it forces you out of your comfort zone. And again, that I think is a, a, a way, much like I mentioned earlier about, you know, kind of the anti, you know, curmudgeon antidote is um, you have to, you have to be in it. You have to be active. You have to, you have to play a role and, and, and getting out of your comfort zone. I feel like, engages parts of your brain that ordinarily you're just waiting and now they they have to be activated and I find that um, valuable in, in trying to you know stay uh, on top of my game so I have, a, I have a I'm gonna take this to the opposite pole right so I have a um, I'm an older uncle he is uh, is about uh, is a late late 80s and very sharp mentally and one of the things he does every time I see him he goes you know, would you like to learn together? And I, I, at first I didn't even know what he was talking about. He's a religious guy, a religious Jewish guy. And um, it's very common in, a, uh, in, in, in the Jewish religion to st- study, this idea of studying. Now you would think like by the time you get to that age, he's actually the son of a famous rabbi that they, you know, that he's got it down. He doesn't necessarily right. need to study. But the study is what he does to keep himself sharp so he has this idea that he has to study every day even though he's an accomplished because he happens to be a doctor very accomplished is a successful you know businessman whatever it is raised a bunch of kids the point being that the studying part is something that he needs to do and it's part of uh, I think one of the successful parts of, 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 of Judaism or Jewish theory is this we're constantly, we constantly need to study, you know, and that is a unique attribute which m- may have led to some of the, you know, advancements right. uh, um, that, uh, that that have happened. So this idea of not never being like stuck in a routine and studying, and then there's the the other part of this this coin, if you will, which is not just studying, but how do you do it? How do you stay focused? And can we focus? on a lot of things so i'm sort of departing to the next topic which is which is focusing can we multitask and the studies on that are pretty clear we we cannot multitask as humans we can do one task at a time best we can do a couple of tasks but when we are doing a couple of tasks we actually are exerting energy they say you lose about 20 percent of your efficiencies if you're doing more than one task so there are people that do multiple tasks, but they're not doing it as efficiently as if they were doing a single task at a time. And it's, it was debated for many years, but really the Harvard study sh- showed that we spent about 47% of our awake time thinking about other things. Hmm. 
And the more we can stop that, the more efficient we can, particularly at uh, the task at hand. So when we're switching back and forth, it's not like we have you know four monitors going at the same time. We have one, we switch to the other, but that there's there's in translation, in transition, there's a, there's a loss there. So the brain is wired to forget about certain things, like. Like if you're wearing a shirt, if you thought about when you first put your shirt on, oh, that feels pretty good. Well, if you're thinking about that 10 minutes later, you're going to have an issue, you know, running away from the tiger. When you're running away from the tiger, all you're thinking about is running away from the tiger. If you're thinking about, oh, I'm running away the tiger, but this loincloth, I guess, is kind of chafing, you're going to get caught by the tiger. So we are learned to hyper-focus. You're going to get caught by the tiger anyway. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> That's right. It's really a good point. At least I didn't say that. I used to, when I used to make this analogy, I used to talk about the pterodactyl. And they're like, right. you know, people in the pterodactyl weren't around at the same time. Right. So I don't know. I'm not really good at the metaphors. You are the master of the metaphor, my friend. You know why um, I think we're having some problems now with some of our, some of our children is the, the phone being the master multitasker. And you know, that th- three pages are open at once, and, and, and I just don't think the brain's wired for it. Now, it's interesting, I heard Elon Musk say that we are, you know, when does he think cyborgs are going to be here? He goes, we are already a cyborg. We're already working with this peripheral brain. We just don't realize it. We're already a form of a cyborg uh, with phones, which, which I thought was kind of interesting, because it's kind of true. And what we have to figure out is how our brain that is a unitasker, single tasker in its most efficient state, how it, how it works with this new piece of technology. This, this one was interesting to me because it, it, for me it didn't fit with the so, other Sorry ones. that the others were not. <laughs> well, this was <laughs> most, this, this one, this, for the reason it didn't fit with the, with the other ones for me because the other ones were all about kind of challenging your brain, mm-hmm. whether it was meeting new people, mm-hmm. learning a, a, a new task. To, uh, getting out of your routine, it almost seems like you're stimulating your brain. Where, whereas this kind of o- overstimulation to a certain extent that you're not focusing, they're saying focus on something that's better for your brain. Now, I understand what you're talking about as far as multitasking and maybe being more in the moment and things like that, how that's helpful. But it's, this one almost seems uh, incongruent with some of the other ones for me. I, I mean, for, for me, uh, these are um, uh, another, another side of the, of the same coin. Maybe it's a multi-sided coin, which I'm not sure what, what that is. But um, this idea of, of focusing on one thing requires energy or requires energy in the sense that you have to consciously not touch this device and that device and look at the TV at the same time. So I... I feel like these are all different sorts of exercises, and some are exercises, um, uh, expanding exercises, and some are reduction exercises. I feel like this focus um, concept is a is is a reduction exercise, and and you know the general commentary I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that uh, in terms of of multitasking or multi attention uh, degrading our ability to be better at stuff and that stuff is having a conversation or really knowing something versus just hearing about something and and repeating at a surface level at a surface level and i think that that is a generational challenge that our generation um, is frustrated with maybe not the next generation which you know is is 15 or 20 years younger than us but our children the general communication issues that i think 50 somethings have with teenagers is exacerbated by the fact that there's no common ground in in communication modalities. I mean, the fact that my kid would rather text me than call me, I feel is problematic on so many, maybe it's just about me. He has to do something. Yeah, yeah. It's just problematic, I think, because that's not the way the world works. And I don't think it will change that dramatically. There's still going to be conversations. It's the reason why we're in this, in this room together is, is the spoken word will always supersede, you know, these easy to misinterpret r- responses. I mean, how many times have you guys reacted differently than the intended message in a text because someone didn't use the right punctuation, didn't, did not take the time to communicate? So, I mean, all those things are, fo- are focus oriented. So um, I'm hopeful that this sort of uh, piece of guidance is not just for people who are aging, but people who are still growing, because I think it's super important 
uh, that you're able to, to be present and, and to have you know, clear communication and be undistracted. Well, at least I can give you some science, right? So if 47% of the time we're thinking about something else, that's not particularly efficient on the things that we're supposed to be thinking about. Right. And if when we're in going in between other things, we're losing 20% of efficiency, I think it's pretty clear that everyone that wants to keep ourselves as, as young and sharp as possible to be efficient, because listen, efficiency degrades over time anyways. So if you want to be as efficient of a thinker, unitask and then go to the next task from when, what you're trying to decipher or what yeah, you're trying I, to I, do. I concur. And that, that was not, it wasn't even a thought that I have. I always thought I was a great multitasker. I thought I was a great multitasker. I was really not. I'm a great single tasker that, that could maybe. Jumps between multitasks. Yeah, yeah quickly. You know, and, 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 and efficiently. Not, yeah. As efficiently as possible and, and, and try and finish one thing and go to the next and be cognizant of it. And I am. I think one of the things I could tell people if they want to reduce their stress is to close all of your open tasks. Whether that's like, you know, when you look on your Google and you've got, you know, 12 things still open, undone emails, yep. like that organization, and I'm not, I'm not particularly, you know, that, that fastidious, but I've found that those little uh, pieces of advice help people to reduce anxiety, which then reduces cortisol, which then reduces blood pressure, which well, then well, think about it. And and we take this to maybe its most practical level, maybe not a, maybe not applicable to everyone who might be listening to this conversation. Mm-hmm. But at practical level, mm-hmm. you have a patient on a table. Mm-hmm. Nobody in that room wants you to be multitasking. Mm-hmm. They want you to be unitasking as mm-hmm. much as possible, and you mm-hmm. want to block out everything. And you need to be focused on the task at hand. Anything else is, by definition, a distraction. Mm-hmm from you being successful. And I think that we f- tend to forget those things as we do things that might be more a little more, more casual. And I think there's a badge of honor that people have, like, oh, I'm a great multitasker. I can do so many things at, this, at the same time. And, and they probably are, it, the pie doesn't get any bigger. We well, want to hear something interesting. This is just an aside story, but I saw, I've, I've noticed a lot of doctors like um, broadcast what they're doing while they're doing it. And I've never thought that was a really good idea. And one of the reasons is I think that if you're doing that and you, you know, aren't focused, you're at a high risk of making a mistake and your high risk of making a mistake for some sort of entertainment doesn't seem to be ethical. Um, so I've been w- wary of that. And I've seen that work to people's both advantage and disadvantage. So for instance, I saw there was a, a famous lawyer recent uh, legal issue where a doctor was doing a deposition and he did the deposition from the operating room, probably just couldn't get out. So, you know, I got to do this deposition, I'm going to do it. So he did the deposition from the operating room. And the judge is like, what's going on in the background? He's like, you know, I'm doing, I don't remember what kind of surgery, spinal surgery or something. And he's like, listen, I had to make this deposition, so here I am, and you're bothering me. And the judge was very upset. And, the, and I think the doctor might have lost his license. It was the judge's wife that he was operating. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is like, you know these these doctors um, they're, they're, that are there's a variety of them. The pimple popper maybe being the most famous. So I, I enjoy watching that show. But at the end of the day, like you're, are you concentrating as much on that patient while you're being filmed with two cameramen and a producer? Like right. I, I don't know. So you know it's the idea of multitasking not being as efficient as single. T- single tasking so let's just try and figure out how to best single task so let's go on to the next topic which talks about okay why you know how do you best single task and and one of the things we mentioned here and and webmd mentions it is meditation what what are your thoughts on on meditation guys well uh let me meditate on that for a second so (laughs) sorry that was a that was a layup um when i was growing up my father used to meditate he, we he had a we you know like a lot of a lot of families we converted our garage into uh, you know a, um, a living space and it's like I'm going in to meditate. I, I mean half the time I think it's more a little bit like weed in there while he was meditating. So that might have been <laughs> might have been a thing too. It seemed odd to me and it seemed odd that um not the weed part just that that oh you know my dad who was like just regular kind of blue collar. Were, were you raised by Cheech and Chong? Like, I, I, I was. Know what the heck's going oh, you on? You think my there? father's the only guy that was born in the '40s, lived in the '60s, who smoked pot? None of, none of, none of your. I know that your parents, of course, did not. So, um, a topic maybe for for a different show. So, P.S. I didn't know anyone else who had meditated. Um, I found it odd that I could interrupt his meditation and then he could get right back in into the meditation, which either meant you know it was really real and he had a lot of control. 
over how he was, you know, processing all that, or he was just wanted to stay away from his kids for, yeah. for, for an hour. And then, you know, that was in the in the mid '70s, let's say, uh, uh, early '80s, that disappeared. The the whole meditation thing. I know it's 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 come up very recently, particularly during the, during the pandemic. There have been some apps that have come out to help people um, facilitate uh, meditation. I personally have not. I've been. It's been suggested many times that I try it. I have not uh, attempted it. It seems like it's helped a lot of people. Um, I, I probably that's probably even an understatement. It has helped a lot of people uh, focus better, get control of their emotions, clear their minds, uh, improve. Well, things. goes so, even farther than that. Hopkins yeah. study shows that it's directly improves obviously anxiety, lowers heart disease, obesity mm-hmm. along the way. How does it do that? One can talk about blood pressure. One can even talk about cholesterol. How does lower cholesterol? So, so let me, not sure, but there are studies to suggest that. Go I'm ahead. sorry to interrupt you. Let me ask you a question about no. that. Because from the um, perspective of science, medicine, individual impact, we hear messages all the time like, don't start smoking. If you start smoking, stop smoking. We may talk about that in a little bit. So, so meditation, which is not as um, uh, obvious, but if you're quoting all these studies where where the outcomes are obvious and indisputable and and dramatic what do you think the gap is why why would a guy like me who has high blood pressure um uh, despite uh having an excellent cardiologist as my as my cardiologist i i, I mean i it's hereditary You've gotten somebody new I take yeah it, so. yeah that's exactly right that's yeah. exactly right why isn't the prescription for me take lisinopril and meditate daily why why don't we hear more of that is it a Western society thing? Is it a um, uh, machismo thing? Is it, uh, you know, like we, we like to fix stuff with pills, not process. So I'm wondering if there's some evidence as to why that is. I, th- I think it's the business of medicine. <laughs> That's what I think. You know, I think it's, it, co- it comes down to, and I'm not saying this is you are, because I, I know you, you, that's probably some advice that you would give to a patient, but the doctor doesn't really get paid for that. Hmm. You know, and there's not, you do have these apps now, and you see a lot of athletes that are endorsing these apps. I have, I, I have not personally meditated, but I have, I have friends that swear by it, that think it's wonderful, they feel differently. It, it takes practice, and you build up. And, but I think in, in that case, it, it's, it's almost like a, a doctor saying, look, you can get better by eating a healthier diet. Or, or, and, and that's, they're never going to go away from the science, which is a lot of these medications do help you more quickly and, and immediately than it's going to take you time. You're not just going to start meditating, as I understand it, and, yep. and feel better immediately. Yep, yep. So I, I, I just don't agree with that, Richie. Um, I don't think. First of all, the doctors don't get paid more to say one or the other. They don't get paid realistically. For instance, I, I think it 100 percent economics comes into. In, in I'm not saying that economics may not have some bearing, but a doctor does not. What you said is a doctor gets paid to say give lisinopril, which is a generic medication, versus um, you know go go meditate. So I'll tell you right now for sure, you know, if you tell someone to go meditate and that person goes and has a stroke because their blood pressure didn't lower, uh, the doctor will definitely be sued. It's problematic. No, it's, I got it's, it. it's, it's, it's malpractice. Yeah. So there are guidelines that we put in place. Um, in specific, um, you know, there are the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, gives you specific, you know, this is your blood pressure, this is your range, this is what you should do first. It's always, you know, make an attempt at proper diet and exercise. Even well, that's the, stu- the studies that you've mentioned, have they, have, do doctors rely on those studies that you've mentioned? With I, would, I would think they would have to rely, I mean, Western doctors have to rely on sort of Western data. I mean, do, you know, doctoring is still an art. Someone could choose to be a little more holistic or less holistic. Alternative is another word. Maybe mm-hmm. these are alternative things. But there's also, you know, straight down the middle science. And, they, and we do data analysis and then metadata analysis. So we really look at this thing kind of in a broad way. You know, medications that we use typically are supposed to be used either at an emergency level. So when the blood pressure, for instance, we're using blood pressure is, is really high or um, after failed attempts at diet right. and exercise. Now, now, should a doctor be involved <clears throat> in all of the diet? Should a doctor be calling you and say, what did you eat today? Um, you know, did you follow the Mediterranean diet? Did you not mm-hmm. go and eat out and so forth? Uh, I, I'm not sure that that's re- reasonable. Um, but to give guidelines and send people to the you know American Heart Association's website that talks about the Mediterranean diet, and the person chooses to 
you know, has free will and chooses to follow it or not yep. follow it. But I do agree with you in the fact that those are our first orders of business. So lifestyle is part of what we're supposed to tell people to do. Unfortunately, if you take a study, let's say Dean Ornish's study that looked at a very stringent diet and lifestyle, which by the way included meditation. So diet, plant exercise, based, plant based, right? M- meditation, um, and a very stringent and controlled environment, the most we could see was probably about a 15% reduction Mm -hmm. in most people's cholesterol, you know, kind of all comers. So that's a lot of effort when a person comes in sometimes and their their cholesterol is 200% the norm. Right. Which we often see. So do you want to tell someone to go do diet and exercise where you're probably going to get 15 or 20% or you want to put them Uh, right on a drug because they have a... They have a mechanical problem in their cells that isn't metabolizing cholesterol correctly. And that's where the art comes into play. Someone who comes in who's like 10, 10% high, yeah, I think they'd be great to be told to go be on a diet and meditate. But, but most of the people that come up, by the time they come into us, are 200% out of a right. norm or, or, or much higher. So you have to decide who's who and when that person requires what. And that's why there's a lot of art in, in, in medicine yet. I mean, you have studies that are population-based, and then there's the individual. So those all come into play uh, in, in that way. You know, the, I think what's valuable about, about this particular topic is that it's not about this topic, and it's about um, systems uh, yeah, of we how we need to manage, you know, health, I think more broadly. I, that may be something we talk about in another, another podcast, because there's this I'm, I'm hearing a couple of different elements here. I mean, some is is um, factual, you know, is linear facts, and then some is about how to inspire someone or motivate someone. Which is which was where we jumped off here for me was I'm not inspired or motivated to meditate. I I may need other help to figure out why that's the case, but I understand it. I understand it. I'm just not motivated to do it. And I'm, I'm I asked that question both maybe rhetorically and then also you know, practically for myself is if, if it's so obvious and I, I do have high blood pressure, I think anyone could benefit, benefit from meditation. I think unraveling that mystery as to why a regular guy like me wouldn't, couldn't find 15 minutes in a day to do it, um, it is an interesting topic to explore because it, 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 it's really more about motivation and inspiration than, a, than about facts. The facts I think are, are irrefutable, yet I'm still not doing it. And I think we can point to lots of other things in our lives as to that disconnect between the factual reality of good or bad behavior and then the practical reality of following or not following those good or bad behaviors. So just maybe a topic for another day. I think, I think we could surmise, summarize by saying um, that more people will benefit from meditation than actually realize that they would benefit. So, you know, obviously if someone's very anxious, maybe meditation would be good. But even, you know, mellow people like probably, you know, some of the people in this, you know, discussion today might benefit from meditation. And some of us find our own ways yeah. to meditate. So, you know, maybe it's when you're driving or maybe when it's, you know, when you're, it's really about focusing, going back to the last thing we talked about, and decluttering right, uh, yeah. a little bit of the stuff that's coming, uh, uh, barraging you during To bring up some of the other factors that we talked about, it is changing your routine. If You you work out, correct? Or, or Sometimes. So so it's changing, it's changing that routine, but there is overlap with some of the other things. T- taking the walk in nature, taking the walk along the beach. It, it, to a me, form of meditation. To me, it's almost a form of meditation, you know, that maybe we're not sitting there you know, going into the into the garage, and, that, and that's how you do it. <laughs> this album is showing me. That's that's how, that's the universal yeah. sign for meditation. This I don't think home. it is. <laughs> I don't know. You have your uh, your thingy there, but um, so there is a lot of overlap between these. Let's go on to sort of the next topic: breaking a sweat or or exercising. Um, people ask me this all the time: What's the best type of exercise? What's the best type of exercise to do long term and keeping yourself, you know, young and sharp? So one of the things that has become very clear: it's it's there's there's no there's very limited controversy right now. Interval training. What does interval training mean? It means not to go for the long distance run. And I'm not saying that long distance runners aren't aren't doing good things for themselves individually, but as a population, interval training. So sort of you know taking a walk and then increasing the speed and then bringing it back down. And the heart likes to see that. There are things that happen within the cardiovascular system that like to deal with sort of an interval of exercise and then going back to a, a baseline level. What is the interval? There are a lot of ways and age-related factors that come into it, but try and make yourself breathless. 
try and make yourself breathless. So if you can get out of breath, you're probably doing the right interval. And then once you're out of breath, don't sustain it for too long. Bring yourself back down. Do that you know, 30 minutes a day, and you're probably doing interval training. Weights and resistance are also important. So the muscles need to be challenged a bit. So whether it's actual you know, free weights or using bands or even doing a body weight, things like push-ups, very important to keep the muscles uh, at a level that they need to need to be before they begin to atrophy. Um, but m- more than anything, all this is consistency. So people talk, well, you got to do it three or four times a week. Not really. You got to do it every day. You can get out of it periodically. You have an injury. You have something that comes up. But I think that we have to come up with uh, consistent and daily patterns, vary those patterns to keep it interesting and to challenge our mind and body, but do it consistently. So what do you guys think? What, what do you guys think about that? That's the kind of the, the basic, the summarized science. You were focusing on the effect. We're talking about the, the keeping your mind young and sharp, right? And, and some of the things that you talked about, 100% necessary for your body, for your, you talked about the cardiovascular effects of it. But this, the, the one point I want to make is that exercise is great for your brain. I, I actually read, I, I know you do most of the study reading, but I read a study when I was thinking about losing weight and the effect of exercise on, uh, on losing weight, on, on what's more important, is exercise or your diet more important? And basically they said about 80, you probably know the numbers better than me, 80, 80% of losing weight is your diet. It's not, mm-hmm. it's not exercising. Mm-hmm. So you start thinking, okay, I don't have to exercise. But then the study, was, the study or the article that I read was very clear. We're not saying exercise is not necessary. Exercise is 100% necessary. It's just a bad marketing tool for losing weight. Yeah, because the math that, doesn't work out. The math doesn't work out, but it has so many other benefits. And yeah. one of these are, you talk physically, cardiovascular, but also, as we're talking about today, is keeping your mind young and sharp to have a regular routine of exercise. And I think that's one of the reasons I feel better doing my 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes at night. I agree, as, as, as the, the mental aspect of, of, of working out, I think there's always a breakthrough to actually do it. You know that that particularly as you get older, you're just, you have 101 other accountabilities. So to get out there and actually do it, I, I think is good. And pandemic related, I can tell you that doing it at a gym or doing it amongst other people is 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 easier. And if, if for no other reason, and I don't know if, um, and I think this is this is pretty universal. It's always somebody in the gym or in your group whom you'd want to be as good as or better than. So the chase. I think it's part of it too. When you're working out alone, I think it's it's pretty easy to, to be complacent or to be in, in in a routine. So, I think just in terms of of you know kind of actively comparing yourself, well, I can't lift as much as that guy, or I'm not as skinny as that guy, or you know whatever the case might be, I think is another way to keep your your mind stimulated because you're 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 chasing the next level on the on the treadmill on the stairmaster mm-hmm. or whatever. So I think all those things come into play in terms of the um, the mental component of it as much as the physical component of it. So we're going to wrap up with what you would normally wrap up with when you're talking about how to keep yourself young and sharp and uh, sleeping. So let's talk real quick. We're going to talk real quickly about sleep and give you this sort of the short science on it real briefly. Um, But we all need somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep. And I know there's a lot of people that don't get that either purposefully or they just can't seem to put it into their schedule. It's historically and now scientifically not healthy. It's not going to keep you as young and sharp as you would like. There are some people that require a little bit less than others, but the numbers seem to be pretty clear. The bell-shaped curve, you know, somewhere between seven and nine. Um, then comes the question of, well, is it all continuous? Are, are naps one of the things? Naps can be beneficial, um, but they got to be short. They got to be 20 minutes or less. And you really don't want to get into the deep REM sleep after about two, three o'clock on a, on a you know, sort of a, a, a typical daily, you know, not a person, a night shift kind right. of scenario. They they want to happen before, say, 2 o'clock and about 20 minutes. You don't want to go really too much into a deep REM sleep because, first of all, you can wake up disoriented and, second of all, it can hurt your sleep at night. So that's kind of some of the, some of the really basic science. Like there's, we can go on and on about the importance of sleep and sleep apnea and things like that, but that's not for today. Today is what's kind of the overarching ideas with sleep and keeping yourself young and sharp. Can I give you a nap trick that I, that I heard? Um, I have one for later. Okay. But. I'm going to do mine first, then yeah. you can do yours. <laughs> so my nap trick is, um, l- let's say it's 2 o'clock, you do want to take, take a nap. Uh, 
you drink a cup of coffee and then take a nap because it takes a while for the caffeine. And if you tell me the caffeine rush immediately, mm. you're, the, you're the doctor, mm. then forget about my nap trick. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've tried this before. Drink a cup of coffee, take a nap, and then in 20 or 30 minutes, like, I got to get up because the caffeine has sort of hit, hit your system. It's full bore, and it's work, work for me. So mm. It's an interesting idea, particularly since... But You're right. It, it does take a little bit for the caffeine, mm -hmm. you know. Particularly if you take in a coffee. You know, the problem is there's a difference between coffee and some of these like Red Bulls. Where right. You, like right. I like to sip coffee. I like to have a cappuccino versus an iced cappuccino or right. Red Bull because you know you're you're basically doing a, a drip, an IV drip, you know, through your oral system to let the caffeine kind of get in there as opposed to taking it too much at once. Right. So it's an interesting idea. It also would keep it from being too long, and you will end up, you know, not probably being able to nap, but maybe just the restfulness is actually. Probably more a form of meditation, helping yourself focus, right. uni focused, and then you can you know go from there. What do you say? No, I'll, I'll give my tip off the air. But, <laughs> but the the thing I want to bring up is we talked about the benefits of napping and sleep for the next day, staying focused. But there's there are studies that show long term wise that can really affect you long term, your brain long term if you're not getting enough sleep, mm, kind of sure. chronically. So I just want to bring up that point. Chronic sleep deprivation or acute sleep deprivation are very very unhealthy not just in the human model but in in, uh, in in a lot of animal models so you know if you want to keep yourself young and sharp you've got to come up with a sleep pattern that works for you uh, and that is consistent that is becomes gold you just don't you want to a lot of people say that the best way to keep good sleep is sleep in a cool room so the average temperature is around 69 degrees and you want to do it around the same time every day because your body does get a rhythm and, and that's melatonin based and we can talk about that on another time you know another day but but at the end of the day cool uh, room uh, quiet absence of phones and blue lights and blinking noises and things like that uh, seven and you know nine hours uninterrupted and uh, you're gonna be younger and sharper so um, with that I wanted to really thank you guys for um, joining the simple MD podcast and coming up with I think and I hope are great uh, tips for everybody to uh, gain something from and uh, I look forward to our next time together so thank you everybody for for joining us remember subscribe uh, to Simple MD and uh, we'll see you next week let's keep it